Hello, Physics 4C. This is the third class. I am continuing chapter 33 of electromagnetic waves, ENM waves for short. I showed you last class that electric fields and magnetic fields move together at speed equal to the speed of light in empty space through empty space, wouldn't you know? Maxwell realized this. James Clerk Maxwell, who I have shown here, found four equations that provide the complete description of electricity and magnetism, and what I'm showing right now links light in with it. So Maxwell's equation provide a complete description of electricity, magnetism, and light collectively referred to as Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. These four vector calculus equations, these four equations with a knowledge of vector calculus basically describe everything that electricity and magnetism do. Maxwell realized this and then with this derivation I showed you last time, Maxwell showed that light is involved too. So electricity, magnetism, and light are all aspects of the same phenomenon. I'd say it's two sides of the same coin, except there are three of them. This is amazing because electricity, magnetism, and light at first don't really seem very closely related to each other. They don't look very much like each other. And they all have the property that they can travel through empty space. They don't require a medium to travel in, like sound waves and air. So electric fields and magnetic fields move together at speed equal to the speed of light in empty space, and they move through empty space. So Maxwell showed that the physical nature of light is light is electromagnetic waves. And here are Maxwell's equations, just four vector calculus equations to surface integrals, Gauss's law for electric fields, Gauss's law for magnetic fields, and then two line integrals, Faraday's law, meaning that a rotating magnet induces a current in a wire, and Ampere's law, that a current through a wire makes a magnetic field. And Maxwell, for the case of empty space, plugged Max uh, Faraday's equation into Ampere's equation, and Ampere's equation into Faraday's equation, and the result were these two equations, and actually deriving them with how Maxwell did, pretty much the way Maxwell did it is a homework problem for chapter 33. These are wave equations Maxwell instantly recognized, where the speed of the wave, one over the speed squared is equal to mu zero times epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space and the permeability of free space, actually the permeability of free space and the permittivity of free space, basically how strong magnetic fields and electric fields are, and plug the numbers in, which Maxwell knew, were well known by Maxwell's time, and he got the speed of light in empty space, 3.00 times 10 to 8 meters per second, and that was well known by Maxwell's time. So, the nature of electromagnetic radiation, the, 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 the nature of light, is that it is electromagnetic waves moving, this group being your first time through this, Let's simplify this as much as I possibly can. Let's say it's moving along the x-axis for a ray of light moving along the x-axis at the speed of light. The speed of the electromagnetic wave equal to the speed of light in empty space. And the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and both of them are mutually perpendicular to the direction the ray of light is going. Uh, where the magnitude of the velocity is equal to c, the speed of light in empty space in it, um, and I should say in empty space. For next chapter, chapter 34, I'll be telling you about refraction, 
but light waves bend because light waves don't just travel in empty space, they can travel in materials too, transparent materials such as glass. And the speed of light in glass is less than the speed of light in empty space. So light waves bend when they move from empty space or air into glass. And that's how lenses work. And we'll cover that in detail, how lenses work and how to do interesting things with lenses like make eyeglasses and telescopes and microscopes in chapter 35. So Maxwell basically showed that light is an electromagnetic wave, an E&M wave traveling through empty space at speed C along the x-axis. Light could travel through the materials, but the speed of light in, in, in glass, say, is less than the speed of light in empty space. And this is inherently a three-dimensional phenomenon. And this being you're probably your first time through this, Looking at a two-dimensional uh, drawing of a three-dimensional thing can be confusing. And here's another two-dimensional drawing that I've done. So the ray of light, just uh, for now, moving along the x-axis, the electric field oscillates perpendicular to it in the plus or minus y direction. And the uh, magnetic field oscillates uh, um, in the plus or minus z direction, and the three vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other. In other words, they're all perpendicular. They're mutually perpendicular. They're mutually perpendicular. The precise term mathematically for that is orthogonal. The three vectors are at right angles to each other. And of course, this isn't the only way that ray light waves can be go. They can travel this way or that way or, or whatever way. The important part is that the three vectors are mutually perpendicular, or in other words, orthogonal to each other. And in an upcoming chapter, chapter, um, the chapter on polarization, it's possible to do interesting things with this, like make polarized sunglasses. And of course, I did last class my silly impersonation of a light wave. Since it is a three-dimensional thing, looking at a two-dimensional plot here, here. Oh, maybe not so easy to uh, realize what's going on your first time through it. So now I will again impersonate a ray of light traveling in the x direction. I'm traveling along at the speed of light in the x direction. My electric field is oscillating in the plus or minus y direction, and my magnetic field is oscillating in the plus or minus z direction. They're all perpendicular to each other. In other words, they're all orthogonal. So I will now impersonate a ray of light traveling through space. That's one wavelength. That's another wavelength. Anyhow, all this came from these equations, which basically was uh, Faraday's law and Sir Newton Ampere's law for the case of empty space, and Ampere's law is certain in Faraday's law for the case of empty space. Okay, these are wave equations. Maxwell understood this instantly. These are wave equations. I'm hoping you remember the, the wave equation, the general wave equation, with the form partial derivative with respect to y, rather, partial derivative of y with respect to x, second partial derivative with regard, um, with respect to x of y. In other words, the second derivative uh, with respect to x only of y is 1 over the speed of the wave squared times the second derivative of y 
with respect to time, because waves move in space, in distance and time, and speed is distance over time. And the reason why this works is the derivative of the sine is the cosine, and the derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. So the second derivative of the sine is minus itself. Waves involve second derivatives. Okay, these are wave equations. The simplest solutions to equations 3319 and 3320 are, these are wave equations, so the simplest solutions will be just simple sinusoids. The electric field being equal to its maximum value times the cosine of kx minus omega t, I'll explain what k and omega me, uh, mean in a second, and the magnetic field being equal to b, rather not b max, b max cosine of kx minus omega t. And again, I will say, try it. Plug these equations into these equations. Plug these two into these two, and sure enough, they come out. Um, these are plane waves. They're the simplest example of these. Um, plane waves come up where E max is the the maximum value of, of the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field. B max is the maximum value of the magnetic field. Lambda is the wavelength, the distance between crests of the wave, between there and there is one wavelength, lowercase Greek letter lambda. And I can show that in this figure. Wavelength is the distance between crest to crest, and we symbolize it with lowercase Greek letter lambda. And for electromagnetic radiation, for visible light, this is the same thing as color. Different colors of light, of, different, of visible light, have different wavelengths. Violet light has a short wavelength. Red light has a longer wavelength, and the other colors visible to the eye are in between. So the shortest wavelength light, violet light, has a wavelength that's microscopic in size, about 400 nanometers, and visible light has uh, a size, again, microscopic in size, about 700 nanometers. Uh, about half a nanometer, rather 500 nanometers, in other words, 0.4 microns and 0.7 microns. Um, the, uh, this is about 100 times uh, smaller than the width, than the thickness of a human hair. A, a human hair is about 75 microns thick. So this is about 0.7 microns thick or 700 nanometers thick. In other words, the wavelength of visible light, uh, even the longest wavelength visible light, the reddest red light the eye can see, is microscopic in size, which explains why it took until so late in history, James Clerk Maxwell, to figure out that it is a wave, um, of, that light is waves. So electromagnetic uh, radiation, uh, light is electromagnetic waves, and visible light, like your eyes can see, 
are have wavelengths that are uh, microscopic in size. K here is the wave number. Wavelength is a length in meters, and a wave number is the number of waves per wavelength that's 2 pi divided by lambda. And so the units, the units are waves per meter or just inverse meters, the waves being understood since you're talking about waves. Let me show you an illustration of that. Visible light is only a tiny portion of the possible wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Most kinds of electromagnetic radiation, most wavelengths are wavelengths much longer or much shorter than the eye can see. Radio waves or electromagnetic radiation, essentially the same phenomenon as light, but you can't see radio waves because wavelengths are too long. And this is radar, gigahertz, approximately six gigahertz. Actually, no, it isn't approximately 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, radar uh, radio waves, relatively short wavelength radio waves. FM radio waves are typically tens of meters long. And AM radio waves are typically hundreds of meters long or kilometers long, but radar has a short wavelength. This particular uh, wavelength, uh, this particular kind of uh, radar waves are about 20 centimeters in wavelength, but sure enough, from there to there is about 20 centimeters. From there to there to there, there to there, that's about 20 centimeters, 10 centimeters is about that much, and twice that much. So the wavelength of these, uh, of this model of, of radio waves, about 20 centimeters, and notice there is one, two, three, four, five waves per meter. So the wave number is one over 20 centimeters, or in other words, five waves per meter. Some people use wavelengths, some people use wave numbers. For example, astronomers and opticians working with visible light tend to use wavelengths. Analytical chemists tend to use wave numbers because there are lots of things, lots of spectral features that identify um, atoms and molecules in the infrared part of the spectrum. When you plot them as a function of wave number, they stretch out and are easy to see in plots, easy to distinguish in plots. And f, lowercase f, is the frequency of the wave. And let me is the frequency of the wave. F is the frequency. How many waves go by per second? And the units are in, well, it's basically waves, number of waves that go by per, uh, per second, or just inverse seconds understood, being understood. We were talking about waves, so frequency second, uh, in other words, cycles per second, or hertz, where one hertz, often abbreviated as just one hz, is one per second, which is one cycle per second, which is one wave per second. They're all the same, they all mean the same thing. Um, I can't stop 
you people from using these different terminologies, but I can show them to you so you understand what different people are talking about. But by far the most is so many hertz, so many cycles per second, so many waves go by per second. For example, AM radio are typically measured in kilohertz, thousands of cycles per second. FM radio is typically megahertz, millions of cycles per second, millions of waves going by per second. Radar waves are typically uh, gigahertz or um, billions of cycles per second. And microwaves are, again, multiple gigahertz. But visible light um, for visible light that the unaided eye can see, a wavelength is about equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters for the reddest, rather the, the most violet light the eye can see. And it's about 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters for the reddest red light it can see. And the other colors are in between, the other colors that the unaided eye can see. And again, different people in the, using working in different fields uh, have different units. This is 0 0.4 microns, which is equal to 400 nanometers. And again, 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, the, the, the wavelength of the longest red light, the longest wavelength red light the eye can see. 0.75 microns, which is 750 nanometers. One micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters, and one nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. Here we go, microns and nanometers and the different units used. And Chapter 14 on waves, recall that wavelength, which is in meters times frequency, which is in inverse seconds or cycles per second or hertz, wouldn't you know that's equal to speed, which is meters per second. So it comes out and for E and M radiation in empty space. This is for all waves of all kind. For electromagnetic uh, radiation, why don't I just say electromagnetic waves in empty space? Wavelength times frequency is equal to the speed of light in empty space. There we go. Therefore, for visible light, which your unaided eyes can see, wavelengths between 4 and 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters imply frequencies of about. 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So each second, about 600 trillion wavelengths of light, wavelengths of visible light.
go into your eyes. One over roughly between four and 7.5 times 10 to the minus seven meters is approximately six times 10 to the 14 hertz which is 10 to the four, 6 times 10 to the 14th cycles per second. So each second, about 600 trillion, 6 times 10 to the 14th wavelengths of visible light go into your eyes. I will leave it up to you to work out the precise values corresponding to these. Again, it's a homework problem. Um, OK. So. is 2 pi times the frequency. It's called the angular frequency. Since we're dealing with cycles, with wavelengths, with cycles, with wavelengths that happen in cycles, the, uh, there are 2 pi radians in a circle, 2 pi radians in a cycle. Therefore, this comes up all the time. Angular frequency is 2 pi uh, times the frequency. And uh, notice that omega over k is equal to, well, omega is 2 pi times the frequency, and k is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. How many uh, waves go by for, um, how many wavelengths go by? How, how many, how, rather, how many uh, wave, uh, waves there are per meter? Uh, 2 pi cancels with 2 pi, and you get is equal to wavelength times frequency, which is equal to the speed of light in empty space. So therefore, omega over k is equal to c. Handy relations. Also, since as I showed you earlier field is equal to the maximum value of the electric field times the cosine of kx minus omega t. And the magnetic field of a light wave going by an empty space, an electromagnetic wave going by an empty space, will be equal to B max. B max times cosine of kx minus omega t. Because this, because of this, uh, and something I showed you last class, that Maxwell derived, the partial derivative with respect to x of the electric field, in other words, the first derivative with respect, uh, with respect to x only of the electric field, is equal to minus the partial derivative with respect to time of the magnetic field, rather minus that. In other words, uh, first derivative with respect to time only of uh, the magnetic field, minus that, because these are all true. Therefore, first derivative with respect to x only of the E field would be E max cosine of kx minus omega t. And that would be equal to minus the first derivative with respect to time of the magnetic field, B max times cosine of kx minus omega t. There we go, close the bracket. There we go, that's all. I just plug these two into this, and there it is. And let's solve it. 
Emacs comes out as a constant. Well, the first rule with respect to x only of cosine would be minus the sine. So minus the sine of kx minus omega t. And since that is an x, a k comes out in front like that, that being the chain rule, minus equals minus sign there, and there would be a b max there coming out of there, except I have written it incorrectly. Here we go, b max, not b x, b max. Derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, so sine um, um, uh, minus the sine, there we go, and uh, cosine kx minus omega t, and again by the product rule you have a minus omega coming out, so a minus omega. The minus cancels with the minus, you get pluses, and sine of kx minus omega t cancels with sine of kx minus omega t, and therefore, that implies that E max over B max is equal to omega over k, there we go, omega k, and that's equal to c, and that is very useful. Remember that e over b cosine terms cancel. Therefore, E over B, the value of E over B, the value of the electric field divided by the, the, the value of the magnetic field at any point in any electromagnetic wave will be equal to E max over B max, which will be equal to C. That one is important enough, this should be lowercase c, meaning the speed of light in empty space. That one's important enough to put a nice rectangle or box around. By the way, when doing homework problems or doing exams, whenever you get the answer you're looking for, put a nice rectangle or box around it. It attracts attention, it attracts the grader's eye, and the grader's eye see your correct answer will be much more likely to give you full credit without an argument. Okay, so this is always true for electromagnetic waves in empty space. It's always true for electromagnetic waves in empty space. And it's very handy. Notice also the electric field of the light wave and the magnetic field of the same light wave will be in phase with each other. As I'll show you later in the course, polarization technology takes advantage of this, makes good use of this. But this relation that the value of the electric field in an electromagnetic wave, in a light wave, divided by the value of the magnetic field anywhere in an electromagnetic wave, anywhere in the same light wave, is equal to the uh, maximum value of the electric field divided by the maximum value of the magnetic field. 
and they are equal to the speed of light. Therefore, you can easily convert from units. Electric fields, remember from physics 4C, are measured in volts per meter. And magnetic fields are measured in Teslas. And you can easily convert them. A volt per meter um, is equal to C meters per second, which is C times Tesla. And that's on the formula list. And you can convert and you, know, you can do more than easily convert between units for electric field and units for magnetic field. This strongly implies that the electric field and magnetic field physically do pretty much the same thing as each other. So as I'll show you later in the course, this basically cuts the amount of work in half. All you have to do is a derivation for what the electric field does and then a magnetic field, you, uh, to find out what the magnetic field does, just multiply times C and you have what the magnetic field does. Practical application, if you're an electrical engineer and you've been told by your company to go measure the electromagnetic field around, say, a power line, and you can do it by measuring the electric field, but actually magnetic uh, devices for measuring magnetic fields, magnetometers are a lot more sensitive. So bring a magnetometer and measure the magnetic field and then multiply it times saying you got the value for the electric field that your boss wants to know or client or, um, or, 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 um, or um, customer wants to know. Okay, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory basically doesn't say anything about the wavelength that the waves have. Experiments in Maxwell's time and afterwards have shown that the wavelengths of visible light are between 400 nanometers, or in other words, 0.4 microns, or in other words, four times 10 to the minus seven meters. And the wavelengths of the uh, longest wavelength, red, uh, light that the eye can see is about a little more than 700 nanometers. It varies from person to person. Um, 700 nanometers, or in other words, 0.7 microns, or in other words, um, 7 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, meters. Maxwell's electromagnetic theory really doesn't say what these values should be. These values were known, but the point is it doesn't say anything that wavelengths shorter than the eye can see can't exist, nor does it say anything about that, that, um, that uh, wavelengths longer than the eye exist. And in Maxwell's time, before Maxwell's time, there were indications that there were kinds of radiation uh, with wavelengths shorter or longer than the eye could see. Old style chemical photography, which had been in use for about a generation when Maxwell was working, old style chemical photography starting in the 1830s with the Jojo types. Old style black and white uh, chemical photography was actually sensitive to ultraviolet radiation. Radiation light, in other words, that with wavelengths shorter than the shortest wavelength of violet light that the eye could see. And uh, about actually 100, 100 years before uh, Maxwell, actually not 100 years, about 60 years before Maxwell, around 1800, so William Herschel discovered infrared radiation by putting a thermometer at the focus of one of his uh, telescopes. And even though there was no visible light, he could still read an elevated temperature indicating that there was heat radiation coming through his telescope that the eye couldn't see. So ultraviolet and infrared. The point is, a general principle of the universe is that anything that isn't forbidden tends to be compulsory. So Maxwell's electromagnetic theory really doesn't make any predictions for what the wavelengths should be. Therefore, the implication meaning they can be anything. And visible light, like your eyes, like your animated eyes are sensitive to, turn out to be only a tiny portion of the wavelengths of light the eye can see. 
This is referred to as the electromagnetic spectrum. When you say the word light, people tend to assume you mean visible light. Therefore, I tend to be careful about this. When I mean ultraviolet radiation or x-rays or gamma rays, all forms of electromagnetic radiation, surely I can see, I don't call it light. I don't call it ultraviolet light. I call it ultraviolet radiation. Likewise, x-rays and gamma rays are understood to be radiation too. Likewise, when I'm talking about forms of electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths longer than the eye can see, like infrared radiation, microwaves, or radio, I don't like to say infrared light. Again, you say the word light, people tend to assume you mean visible light, and infrared radiation has wavelengths longer than the eye can see. So don't call it infrared light, call it infrared radiation. So, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible and invisible light are electromagnetic radiation or the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light, which human eyes can see, makes up only a tiny portion of the possible kinds of electromagnetic radiation, the difference between which is their wavelength. Again, within the narrow range of wavelengths that visible light can have, different colors have different wavelengths of light. Visible light is given off by stars roughly the same temperature as the sun. The sun radiates its maximum intensity right in the middle of the wavelengths of visible light. It is no coincidence probably that our eyes evolved to be most sensitive to those wavelengths of radiation. There are stars that are hotter than the sun and their maximum um, intensity is actually at wavelengths shorter than the sun, than, than the eye can see, ultraviolet radiation. There are things even hotter than that, the gas going down black holes. A black hole, of course, once the gas goes into the black hole, it's lost to this universe, but just before it pours into the um, black hole, uh, the black hole's gravity compresses us so much by the ideal gas law that it heats up to millions of degrees, millions of Kelvin, and it radiates x-rays. And notice, uh, this is from gas, thousands of times hotter than the sun, and the wavelengths that it has, the, its maximum intensity has, are thousands of times shorter than visible light has. Gamma rays have even shorter wavelengths. Gamma rays come from nuclear reactions. X-rays come from inner electron transitions. Ultraviolet radiation comes from the hottest stars. Visible light comes from stars like the sun and also outer electron transitions. Chemists, analytical chemists use those to tell what things are made of. Infrared radiation has wavelengths longer than the eye can see. Notice that the wavelength of visible radiation is between 0 0.4 and about 0 0.78 microns. Infrared radiation is about 0 0.78 to 100 microns. This comes from room temperature objects, such as human beings, military night vision goggles, uh, are sensitive to infrared radiation. Snakes can also sense infrared radiation. It helps them hunt warm-blooded prey, such as mice in the cold desert floor. So infrared radiation comes from room temperature objects, including human bodies and planets. Microwaves uh, come from even cooler objects. Microwaves have longer wavelengths, millimeters. When I was taking, when I was an undergraduate taking the course that is equivalent to Physics 4B, one of the cooler uh, labs was measured the uh, wavelength of a microwave. It's actually about one centimeter. And radio waves, centimeters and longer. Natural sources include the very cold gas between the stars. In my own field of astronomy, the opening of the electromagnetic spectrum has been the biggest thing to happen in observational astronomy, really in the past couple of generations, really in the past 60 or 70 years, a generation being 33 years. Um, and this is a picture by NASA of the various electromagnetic radiation, the, very, the, very, the, various, the, very, the various invisible kinds of radiation and visible light, and a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, 
Um, back when astronomers were only capable of observing visible light and visible wavelengths, back in Galileo's day with their eyes through a telescope, starting in the 1800s chemical photography, which was mainly sensitive to visible light, uh, they could only detect and record visible light, images in visible light. So back in those days, it was kind of like watching television with only one channel. Now we got all the channels. Starting in the 1930s, astronomers started picking up the long wave radio waves. And uh, starting in the 60s, the microwaves. And also starting in the 60s, the infrared radiation and the x-rays. And actually, ultraviolet radiation, they had uh, started picking up earlier than that. In the 70s, gamma rays. So uh, for some time now, astronomers have been able to observe all the different wavelengths of light. And we learn about the universe much faster and much better than we used to. Because again, back in the days before the 1930s, when we could only observe at visible wavelengths. It's like watching TV with only one channel. This is a darn good analogy because that's how the channels on a television work. They are broadcast at different wavelengths and the electronics of the TV set that goes the signal into the pictures and sound. Uh, if you only had one channel, you wouldn't see very much. Likewise, if your ears were capable of hearing only one note on the musical scale, you couldn't listen to very much music. But now we can hear all of the scales. We can, we can basically uh, detect light at all the different wavelengths, analogous to being able to hear musical notes with all the different, um, all the different wavelengths, all the different frequencies or if watching television, now we got all the channels, so we get a much better, much broader picture of this. This all started, well, about, let's put it this way, a big event in this was in 1887, Heinrich Hertz successfully tested predicted the, as I said, uh, the predictions of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Notice that Maxwell publishes electromagnetic theory in 1865, so it didn't take long for some bright experimental scientist to actually build some instruments to actually test this theory. Uh, Heinrich Hertz, in 1887, Heinrich Hertz successfully tested the predictions of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Basically, the prediction that there would be wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that the eyes couldn't see, and with the technology that he had available to him at the time, in 1887, of course, it looks comically primitive compared to what can be done today. But nevertheless, um, Hertz reasoned that if Maxwell's theory doesn't forbid there being wavelengths of light much longer, wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation much longer than visible light, he should be able to transmit it and receive it, and that's exactly what he did in his lab. He was the first to transmit and receive what are now called radio waves. At first, they were called Hertzian waves. It's too bad that he died young at age 36 because he deserved a Nobel Prize for that, but they weren't giving out Nobel Prizes until 1901. Wilhelm Röntgen got the very first Nobel Prize in physics in 1901, because in 1895, he had discovered x-rays. So radio waves are electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths much shorter than the unaided eye can see. Wilhelm Röntgen discovered x-rays, which are electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths much longer, rather, rather not longer, shorter. Radio waves have wavelengths much longer than the unaided eye can see like these, like this, much longer, centimeters or even meters in length. The longest known radio waves, the, the wavelengths with the, 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 the radio waves with the longest known wavelengths have uh, wavelengths larger than the Earth, thousands of kilometers across. 
problem is they don't transmit through the Earth's upper atmosphere, the ionosphere. This is one reason to want to put radio telescopes on the far side of the moon. I will leave that open as, a, as, an, open, as, as an exercise to the student. But again, Hertz successfully tested the prediction of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory by being the first to transmit to see radio waves. Electromagnetic waves with wavelengths longer than the eye could see, and Bill and Merkin discovered X-rays, electromagnetic waves with wavelengths shorter than the eye can see. Bill and Merkin discovered X-rays in 1895 accidentally. There was a ser this was a serendipitous discovery. Serendipity means happy accident. Serendipity means a, her a happy accident. It is a bad name to give to a child. Bill and Rinkin discovered x-rays accidentally or serendipitously in 1895. The story goes that he was working with a Crookes tube, which basically was the great-grandfather, great-grandparent uh, of uh, what would become the old style TV tube. Nowadays, TVs, of course, use the photoelectric effect and leave it in physics, flat screen, but your grandmother may have a cathode ray tube TV uh, around your house. Bill Merkin was working with a primitive uh, version of that. This was decades before television. It was just pure physics research, these weird rays that happen when you turn the current on. He didn't realize what was going on, that he was shooting electrons into a screen that would glow because of the energy in the electrons. And the story goes, when he had this machine, his experiment turned on, he happened to put his hand in the beam, and then just by chance, he happened to glance at the shadow uh, that his hand was casting on the backside of his machine, and he was astonished to be able to see the bones of his hand. I hate to think of the dose of x-rays he was getting when he did that. X-rays are electromagnetic radiation, essentially just like light, but with wavelengths thousands of times shorter than, uh, wave, than visible light has, and therefore energies thousands of times higher X-rays have energies so high they can go right through the soft tissues of the human hand, but not the bones. So doctors pretty much immediately started using them to take pictures of people's bones. Gamma rays have even shorter wavelengths than X-rays. The problem with gamma rays is they uh, have uh, such high energy, they go right through the bones too. So doctors do not use them or to take pictures of people's bones. But x-rays are right in that sweet spot. They have a thousand times shorter wavelength than the um, than visible light has, therefore a thousand times greater energy. They can go right through the soft tissues of a human um, hand, of a human body, uh, but not the bones. So doctors use them to take pictures of people's bones. The next day, Bill and Merkin got his wife, Mrs. Merkin, to come into the lab and he had her put her hand down on an old-fashioned photographic film, and he ran some x-rays through it, and he took a picture of her hand, and noticed that the x-rays go through the soft tissue of the human hand, but not the bones, and not the gold wedding ring, because gold is a heavy substance, um, a heavy, atom and uh, heavy, dense atom, and therefore x-rays do not go through it. Nevertheless, this was really a screaming big deal. And both Hertz and Röntgen both did a very good job in showing, Hertz did a very good job in showing that radio waves or electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths longer than the eye can see, than the unaided eye can see. And Willem Röntgen did a very good job showing that X-rays or electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths shorter than the eye can see. 
Um, X stood for unknown, but it was Rimkin in his very first paper who basically showed this is actually a form of electromagnetic radiation. This is, these are electromagnetic wave, these are electromagnetic waves, but with wavelengths much shorter than visible light. And so they and others basically worked out the properties of electromagnetic radiation that we will be dealing with in the next several chapters of the book. So the properties of electromagnetic or EM radiation. In 1887, Heinrich Hertz experimentally confirmed Maxwell's electromagnetic theory by being the first to transmit or receive radio waves. In 1895, Bell and Röntgen serendipitously, or in other words, accidentally discovered X-rays. They were named X-rays because their nature was unknown at first. Symbol X denotes an unknown. In a series of experiments, Hertz showed that radio waves are electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths over a thousand times longer than visible light. In a similar series of experiments, Rinkin showed that X-rays were also electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths a thousand times shorter than visible light. Both series of experiments did this by showing that radio waves and X-rays have these properties, which visible light also has. Namely, radio waves, X-rays, and visible light all have speed equal to C, the speed of light in empty space. They're all transverse waves with the electric field perpendicular to the mag uh, magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of travel, or rather precisely, the direction of the oscillation of the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of the oscillation of the magnetic field. And both of them together are, um, are perpendicular to the direction of the electromagnetic radiation whether radio, x-rays, or visible light, the direction that it's traveling. All of them have this property here, that everywhere along an electromagnetic wave, wave everywhere along the cycle, uh, the value of the electric field divided by the value of the magnetic field is equal to the maximum value, the amplitude of the electric field, uh, divided by the amplitude of the magnetic field, and those are equal to C, the speed of light, in empty space for electromagnetic waves in empty space. Electromagnetic waves, uh, whether radio waves, visible light, or x-rays, they all reflect off of surfaces. And we will cover that in next chapter, chapter 34, and also chapter 35. Chapter 34, we'll just talk about the physical property of reflection. But 35, we'll do, we'll do something useful with it, and talk, I'll tell you about mirrors. All kinds of electromagnetic radiation, whether long wavelength radio waves, medium uh, wavelength visible light, or short wavelength x-rays, they all refract. In other words, they bend when they travel into media, into substances with speed, with, where the speed of light is less than the speed uh, of light in a vacuum. The speed of light in a um, in glass is less than the speed of light in empty space. Therefore, light waves bend when they move from empty space into light. That's how lenses work. So chapter 34, I'll tell you about refraction. Chapter 35, I'll tell you about applications of that, namely forming images with lenses. All forms of electromagnetic radiation, whether they have wavelengths shorter than uh, visible light, like x-rays, or longer than visible light, like radio waves, or whether they are visible light, all of them interfere with other waves. In other words, you can combine them in phase with each other, and they constructively interfere with each other, they amplify each other, or you add them up out of phase with each other, and they can destructively interfere with each other. What most people think when, they, when you say the word interfere, radio interference, you have radio stations interfering with each other's signals. All forms of electromagnetic radiation diffract, which means that they bend around corners. We'll cover that in chapter 37. And all forms of electromagnetic radiation, regardless of wavelength, can be polarized, which means that they can have their electric fields only in a specific direction, like in Polaroid sunglasses. Diffraction and polarization will be in chapter 37. So this gives you a preview of what we'll be covering. Reflection, refraction, lenses, mirrors, interference, diffraction, and polarization. 
Visible light does all this too. So do all other forms of electromagnetic radiation, including infrared, ultraviolet, microwaves, gamma rays. And by transverse waves, by the way, all electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, is that they oscillate in a way, they oscillate in a direction perpendicular, the oscillation in the wave. To be a wave, something's got to repeat, something's got to oscillate. So transverse waves oscillate perpendicular to the direction of travel. In other words, the direction of propagation. An example of a transverse wave is a water wave at the beach, big old wave coming at you, rising up out of the water. But it's coming at you, but the amplitude of the wave, the oscillation, is perpendicular to the direction it's going. That's a transverse wave. So a water wave at the beach. Electromagnetic waves are also transverse waves. Another example of a transverse wave is a guitar string. A guitar string, you pluck it and that goes like that, back and forth. It doesn't go up and down like that. It goes back and forth like that. So the guitar string, when you pluck it, the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction that the wave is going. Longitudinal waves, on the other hand, oscillate parallel to the direction of travel. In other words, the direction of, uh, of, of, of propagation. An example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. Sound waves go like this. They don't go, sound waves don't go like this. That's a transverse wave, like a water wave in water. Sound waves go like this. The oscillation is in the direction of the direction of propagation, the direction of travel. And notice when you're at a really loud concert, you can hear you, the sound waves going into your ears and making your ear go making your eardrums go uh, 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 like that, or looking at a speaker that's playing really loud and it's going uh, 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 uh. Don't do that, you might break the speaker. Drums, the head of a drum does that. You hit a drum and it goes mm -hmm, like that. It's too bad this is an in-person class because at this point I'd ask, what kind of waves, transverse waves, Electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, but sound waves are longitudinal waves. Um, electromagnetic waves, visible light and all the other wavelengths, electromagnetic radiation, they're transverse waves in empty space, although they can travel through matter too. Longitudinal waves can only travel in matter. Sound waves need air to propagate in, or water, or solid, you can have Earthquake waves go through the earth. And I will ask, if this were an in-person class, I'd ask, what kind of waves do you think earthquake waves are, seismic waves are? The people guess longitudinal waves because they're sound waves, but actually earthquake waves can also be transverse. Earthquake waves, seismic waves, you have both kinds of waves, both transverse and longitudinal waves. Our much beloved department secretary, the physics department, Nancy Wright, was watching the World Series in Candlestick Park in San Francisco in 1989 when the big earthquake hit. And the longitudinal wave hit first. And it made the whole stadium go boom, 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 boom. And she said that was very disturbing. And from the crowd, you know, all the people in the crowd started screaming. And the, the sensation, oh, this is the big one. And then the transverse wave hit. And she said that was much scarier because that made the whole stadium, a steel frame structure, go way, 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 which is not a good thing for a steel, uh, for a steel girder structure, a structure made of steel uh, girders, a steel frame structure to do. You don't want any of those girders or the joints in between them to snap. Nancy said she had had quite enough of this and decided to leave the stadium at once and get in her car and drive home. She, drive over, she drove over the Bay Bridge about half an hour before the upper deck collapsed and killed a couple hundred people. Anyway, now you know why this stuff is important for engineers in California to know. Not just electromagnetic waves for electrical engineers, 
uh, waves in general for mechanical engineers practicing in um, in uh, here in California. This is good stuff to know. You don't want earthquakes to make your buildings fall down. So the electrical, the electromagnetic spectrum includes both visible and invisible wavelengths. Notice how visible light is only a tiny range of wavelengths. And this is again wavelength plot of wavelength. And since uh, wavelength times frequency is equal to speed of light in empty space, you can plot frequency on this side too. And notice that visible light, here's the visible light. It's just a tiny little portion of wavelengths. Ultraviolet has shorter wavelengths. X-rays have even shorter wavelengths. Gamma rays have even shorter wavelengths. And visible light is only a tiny uh, range of wavelengths. Infrared radiation has longer wavelengths. Microwaves have longer wavelengths. Radio waves consisting of microwaves, radar waves, uh, TV, FM radio, radio waves, and long wave AM radio waves, and even longer wave radiation um, wavelengths, many kilometers. FM is typically tens of meters. Radar is typically a few centimeters. Um, infrared night vision devices typically work at a wavelength of about 10 microns. Wavelength of visible light is about half a micron, microscopic in its size, therefore it's no wonder it took until so recent in history for people to figure out any of this. Uh, but now we have figured it out and now there are technologies that take advantage of all these wavelengths. Uh, radio communication, microwaves for radar, also cooking, infrared for cooking, and infrared for remote control, television remote control. Ult uh, it goes on and on and on. Ultraviolet x rays for medical imaging, gamma rays for uh, cancer therapy. Uh, it's astonishing. It's astonishing because now we have so many different technologies making use of just about all these wavelengths. And yet, when Maxwell published his treatise on electromagnetism uh, in 1865, he was fired from his job, from his professorship at the University of Glasgow. Basically, the older professors in that department denied him tenure, basically because they couldn't understand vector calculus. They couldn't get their minds around it. It seems incredible nowadays, because now we have so many different kinds of technology that uses every bit of this. Vindication is sweet. Let me stop there for today.